And now our keynote speaker, Yasha. Yasha Franklin Hodge. You know, we were looking for a social media expert, and we talked and looked around, and um, to our surprise, the person we were looking for was maybe half a block down from where we have our offices right now, right on Summer Street. You know, we thought we wanted somebody, and we did get somebody, not only with extensive experience, but a great deal of knowledge, but someone that's actually used the tools in very effective ways. And more than that, we wanted somebody that not just did the what, but could talk to you more importantly about the why, and the who, and how it really works. So, we look with that in mind, we have Yasha Franklin Hodge, who is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Blue State Digital, which is a full service digital agency that develops and executes multi-platform engagement campaigns for nonprofits, advocacy associations, political candidates, causes, brands, and businesses. BSD's work inspires and mobilizes people, increases revenue, cements lasting support and loyalty. BSD has helped many clients, including Dilma Rousseff, the first female president of Brazil, HBO Television, the American Red Cross, but perhaps their biggest impact was felt in the 2008 election when they worked for Obama for America, creating an online campaign operation that was unprecedented in size and scope. Blue State Digital's efforts led to President Obama's campaign raising more than half a billion dollars online mobilizing millions of Americans and volunteers and building an email list of more than 13 million people. Folks, we are, really have a very special person here to do that, but one thing that I just found out today that I had not known from Yasha is that the council was familiar with Yasha's mother. <laughs> Yasha's mother, Diane Franklin, has been a presenter at our convention and it's funny how I'm glad that he did share that information in his mom that he's doing something, and I'm sure she's proud that he's doing something. And she said, well, yeah, I already know about that. I've done that already. <laughs> so uh, with those encouraging words and support, please welcome our keynote speaker, Yasha Franklin Hodge. Thank you for the, uh, the generous introduction, and uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a remote to be uh, calling out, so we can go to the first slide here. Uh, so, uh, just very quickly, a little bit about who we are as a company. Um, uh, it might give you a little bit of a sense, but basically, we're, we're sort of two businesses. One is a strategic consulting uh, digital marketing agency for uh, political campaigns, not-for-profit organizations, variety of uh, some for-profit. The other is a software company. And we provide a software platform that lets organizations, big and small, run their on, the online aspects of their organization. So whether it's sending email, taking donations, engaging people through social media, we provide this sort of toolkit for that. Uh, we have about 120 people in five offices, one of which is right here in Boston. Uh, we're also in New York, DC, London, and LA. And we work with a, a pretty broad variety of organizations. Uh, as you can probably guess from the name, uh, we got our start in politics. And uh, we've since broadened out to other not-for-profit organizations uh, and some corporate work as well. The company was started in 2004. We came out of Howard Dean's presidential campaign, which, uh, for those of you who remember, was uh, for all the things we didn't quite get right, it was one of the first campaigns to effectively use the internet to raise money, but also to engage people and to really build a, uh, an army of, of folks who were passionate about the campaign and who were primarily connecting to it, or at least initially connecting through it, online. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, this is what we're about. This is our mission. And the idea is that we want to help our client organizations who are all doing amazing and interesting things uh, and important things in the world. We want to help them achieve measurable, measurable results for their goals. But the way we do it is by inspiring people and engaging people to participate. And that's ultimately our goal as an organization is to figure out how to, how to tell the story, how to get people engaged, how to get people plugged in. Technology is a tool for that, and we make extensive use of the internet, and we'll talk about some of the, 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 the techniques that we use for that, but ultimately, if there's no inspiration, if there's no engagement, there's not really any success. 
Um, so what I want to do is uh, walk through the, a, a very quick uh, case study of, uh, of the client we're best known for. I think Michael gave you some of the statistics. Uh, next slide. So uh, in the 08 campaign, more than a billion email messages sent to more than 13 million people. But one in five Obama voters were on the email list, we think. And that's sort of the benchmark that we set for our clients is, hey, if you can get one in five people who are touched by your organization, who are engaged with your organization onto your email list or connected to you through social media, you're doing pretty well. Um, it's, a, it's a tough thing, and it really helped to have, you know, of course, uh, two years of intensive news coverage to get to that threshold, but that's a, that's a, it's a useful benchmark. Um, but for success online, it's as often about, as much about what you're doing offline as it is about what you're doing online. And the, off, the online tool has become a vehicle for organizing things that happen on, offline, organizing the events on the ground, raising the money that lets you deliver services, doing the recruiting for volunteers, getting people in the community engaged, doing the advocacy work uh, with legislative bodies. So one of the steps from this campaign, we had over 200,000 offline events planned via the web. These were using the, the tools that we provided and through the online community, people had house parties, they had volunteer days, they had voter registration drives, all of these things were sort of mediated through the internet. And so, you know, while the objectives of a presidential campaign are, are very different from the specific objectives of your organizations. We look at the internet as providing a, a tremendous opportunity to engage people to do the things that matter on the ground. It isn't just about people wasting time online, it's about how do you plug them into the stuff that's important. Similarly, 35,000 local volunteer groups organized via the internet. These were the groups in most, in many cases in states where the campaign in the early days couldn't afford to actually put people on the ground. So instead what they did is they recruited volunteers to form their own groups to organize. In some cases we had people who actually opened offices uh, for the campaign, unbeknownst to anybody in Chicago. Uh, and the campaign would, you know, once, once the state's primary was drawing near, the campaign would sort of send people to the, to the state and start, you know, trying to set up an organization and they'd sort of realize, wait a second, we mean we already have three offices here and, uh, you know, 300 people who are knocking on doors. So that online organization created that groundwork that the campaign was able to build on. Uh, 14 and a half million hours of YouTube viewing of campaign created video material. If you bought that much airtime, it's about 40 million dollars worth of television. Uh, but that was all, you know, created by engaging people through social media, getting people to share the video content, getting people to tell their friends about it. And then of course the money. Um, the campaign raised an unprecedented amount of money and the bulk of it came in online. Uh, next slide. So, that's just an example. Uh, obviously not every organization is going to raise half a billion dollars online, but the ideas and the concepts that let the Obama campaign be successful online, I think are very applicable to uh, organizations big and small. And so we're going to talk through some of those, those kind of principles. But before we do that, I just want to quickly sort of ask the question of what is social networking? Uh, you know, it's obviously this, it's Facebook, we all know that. Next slide. Uh, it's Twitter, next slide. But it's also this. Uh, this is some, uh, a group of social workers doing visibility in a train station in uh, Philadelphia. Um, social networking isn't just about technology. And for people like me who live and breathe tech all day, every day, it's very easy for us to get enamored of the, the cool things we build or the, the toys that we have. And, and you know, a lot of times people miss the point that what social networking is about is about relationships. It's about building strong relationships with the people in your community that matter, whether that's donors, volunteers, legislators, uh, you know, people receiving services. It's the relationships that ultimately are what makes you successful or not, both online and offline. And so there's a lot that you can do to build relationships online. And what we're gonna do here is talk through kind of four key ideas about building online relationships. And that, the, the, the four things are action, story, storytelling, authenticity, and ownership. How do you give people a sense of ownership? So we'll start with action. Uh, next slide. Action. One more. So this is an example of what you don't want to do. And I'm going to apologize now for uh, to all the Republicans in the room that uh, all of, my, all of my what you don't do examples are uh, from the GOP and uh, uh, the rest are from, uh, from my side of the fence. But I will say, uh, you know, 
bad online campaigning, bad online engagement is a nonpartisan problem. Sorry, it's a bipartisan problem. But this was, this was an email that the McCain team sent uh, right after he, it was pretty clear that he was going to become the GOP nominee for president in 2008. And it's awful. This is eight, is it eight paragraphs, I think, before you get to the first link. The link is just the word Florida. It doesn't respect people's time. It doesn't, you know, if you're not really, really committed, you're not reading through that. And you're just going to delete it from your inbox and probably not open the next email that comes in. So what you want to do whether, whenever you're communicating with people online is drive them to take actions. Those don't have to be big actions. Those can be uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, signing a petition or sharing a link or watching a video, but getting away from giant blocks of text. And this is sort of an example of a design that uh, we did for a group uh, called Share Our Strength around the program to try to end childhood hunger. And so the idea was when we built the web design was to design it for action. What are the things we want people to do? We want them to sign a pledge, we want them to, to share the uh, ideas and the goals of the campaign, we want them to donate, we want them to volunteer and take action. So instead of bombarding people with text, with policy, with sort of you know, stuff that's, that's dry, we said, let's focus it on what they can do and how that can have an impact. Uh, same goes for social media, um, you know, and social networking sites. But Facebook is a really challenging environment for organizations that are trying to get people to take action because you're surrounded by things that are often more interesting and more engaging than the message you're trying to get across. Every page has pictures of your friends. It has links to things that people are doing. It has. Uh, you know, the little flashing, you have messages indicator, it's got, it's a very distracting environment. And so our goal and what we encourage people to do when they're thinking about how to build a Facebook or a Twitter strategy is to use it as, a, almost as an embassy for your organization and for your activities. So think about the actions you're trying to get people to take online. Think about the pages you want people to land on, the content you want them to see, the email list you want them to sign up for, and use the social networking sites as a way to get that message out and to draw people back in to your organization site where you can capture some, uh, you know, a, a more durable relationship with them. Um, it's great to have people like you on Facebook. It increases the chance that any message you publish on Facebook will show up in their newsfeed. But at the end of the day, likes are, uh, you know, they don't count for much. If you have a million people who like you and none of them are doing anything for you, you may as well have zero. Um, so the trick is using the social media platforms to draw people back into the things that are actually going to make a difference. Next slide. Um, equally important when we think about how to get people to take action is taking advantage of certain moments in time. Um, what's happening in the news? What are people thinking about right now? What's going on in the world? This is uh, an example, a fairly recent example, of an email that we helped uh, the American Red Cross put together on the day of the uh, earthquake in Japan. And this was ended up being their, their single most successful fundraising email of all time. This email got sent uh, in the afternoon of the Friday of the earthquake. Now, if this email had been sent on Saturday or on Sunday, would not have been the most successful fundraising email that they did. It's incredibly important to piggyback on things that people are seeing in their world, that the urgency that surrounds uh, events, whether it's a disaster or a story about a, 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 you know, a, a human services crisis, whether it's about funding and uh, budget battles, but piggyback on that and be responsive, act quickly. Uh, think about you know how many people in an organization have to be involved in getting an email out the door or getting a message posted up on your website. Try to trim that down or at least have a plan to sort of say, hey, when there's a crisis, when there's an opportunity, let's seize it quickly and act on it. Next slide. Um, so anybody have an idea of who Obama's number one, the number person who raised the most money for Obama? No, no, one person. <laughs> no. That one. Um, so, Sarah Palin, if you watched the Republican convention, this is a, a still from the, uh, the GOP convention in 2008, she gave a speech that for Democrats and progressives was 
uh, infuriating, I think is probably the best word to use. She got up on stage and she talked about, she sort of mocked the idea of the Obama organization. She mocked the whole notion of community organizing. She sort of made it, that's oh, a bunch of kind of crazy liberal people. Next slide. But, you know, for a Democrat watching that, you're sitting there, you're angry, you're frustrated, you feel powerless. The idea of this, you know, woman and this philosophy being, you know, are, what's, what's governing the country is just so demoralizing. Well, two hours after she walked off the stage, everybody on the Obama email list got this message from the campaign. It was a direct response to Sarah Palin. And it said, community organizing is how ordinary people respond to out-of-touch politicians and their failed policies. It was a direct rebuttal. And it, it was right in the moment, right after people had seen this you know, incredible uh, uh, display of, of just cynicism and uh, you know, disregard for what they were trying to do and the values that they held dear. That email raised $12 million in the 24 hours after she walked off the stage, and it was the single most successful fundraising day for the Obama campaign. So thank you, Sarah. But um, you know, it underscores the importance of immediacy and urgency and thinking about where there's an opportunity, where people are seeing something in the news, or people have a, there's a moment in time that you can, that you can capture to, uh, to, to, to be on that quickly. Uh, next slide. So the next idea that I want to talk about is, uh, you know, when we think about relationship building online is, is that of storytelling. Uh, next slide. So this is actually an example that, that doesn't come at all from the political or not-for-profit space. This is some work that we did with Vogue magazine. Um, and, you know, Vogue is, a, is, is an interesting organization. Um, it has a, a, a lot of very, very passionate subscribers. And historically, they hired us to help them with their email program and help them with their online program. Historically, what they've been doing with their email lists is they've been sending these incredibly dry uh, marketing type emails, just overwhelming people with subscription offers or uh, branded promotions or uh, you know marketing emails from uh, advertisers. And you know their open rates were terrible, their click through rates were terrible. They weren't selling very many subscriptions. So we came in, and the first this is the first email that we sent for Vogue. And it came, instead of from Vogue.com or Style.com, it came from Grace Coddington, who is the creative director of Vogue magazine. And really, if any of you have seen the documentary, uh, the September issue, she's really the sort of artistic force behind the magazine. And it was a very personal email. It was from Grace, and she, she, she just told the story of the first time she picked up a copy of Vogue and what it meant to her and how it affected her life. And then she asked readers and asked subscribers to tell their own story about Vogue and why it mattered to them, what, how they got, how they came to become readers of the magazine. It we had an overwhelming response, not only online, but people started picking up this, their phones and calling Vogue and asking to speak to Grace, and um, they were a little like, what, what have you done here? Um, we had this overwhelming flow of people telling stories, and a lot of them, you know, some of them were, were sort of very typical, some of them were really interesting personal stories, you know, people who grew up in communities that had no... Where, where there was no, there's no culture around fashion or anything like that, but for whom this was a window into a different world to them. People, you know, we had uh, a couple of stories from, from women who talked about getting a gift of a Vogue magazine subscription when they were, uh, you know, 12 or 13 years old from a grandmother or a relative and how that sort of, that, you know, that had an impact on their life. That kind of storytelling, where you're not just pushing marketing messages that people are not just telling people, hey, you know, buy this or take this action or do this thing, but share with us your emotional engagement with uh, a brand, a cause, an issue. That helps build a relationship with people. And when you do go and ask people to do something, they're more inclined to act. They're more inclined to respond. They're more, uh, they feel a deeper connection to, to your organization and what you're trying to do. Um, and in this case, we actually got a lot of content that people shared with us, you know, just telling their stories of uh, the magazine. I talked about the, the kind of people who had received it as a gift. When we sent gift subscription requests to people that followed up with this, instead of just a generic, hey, buy a gift, we'd include some stories from actual readers about how they received it as a gift. And it created that sense of, oh, I, I see why I should do this. I see why, you know, I can, I can give this to somebody. So think about those opportunities to tell your own stories and ask people to, to share theirs. Next slide. 
Um, you know, similarly, uh, you know, there are ways to do this that uh, aren't just about writing and aren't just about written content. These are two screenshots from clients of ours. Uh, uh, Geisinger is a, is a, a, a health uh, healthcare system uh, that uh, we did some work with, helping organize their internal uh, uh, their nurses, basically, to sort of tell the story of why nursing care matters and, and to, to to show the faces of the people who are providing this excellent care. And so we asked people to upload a photo of themselves and talk a little bit about why they became a nurse, what their, the, the things that made the profession so meaningful to them. And then that became a source of very rich content that was shared with the larger community. Uh, in the background, you see uh, something from Autism Speaks, their uh, uh, lighted up blue campaign uh, for autism awareness. And what you're seeing here is actually a Flickr gallery where they invited people in the community who were wearing blue or who lit up their, their business or their house blue uh, you know, as part of Autism Awareness, it was actually just this past weekend. They invited people in the community to upload their own photos. So looking for those opportunities for collaborative storytelling, getting people within the larger community to tell a story and then to share it through the internet is a great way to build relationships with your larger community. Um, this is another example of this uh, user-generated video. This is something that we did for, it's a, it's a project that was started by the columnist Dan Savage. Um, there's a wave of, of suicides last year uh, uh, by gay and lesbian teenagers. And so he and his partner had this idea that they wanted to send a message to uh, all the folks who were uh, you know, depressed and feeling like you know life was kind of hopeless. That hey, it gets better. You get older. You you know you become a part of a more accepting community. Uh, you make more friends. And so he built. Uh, he initially started just by him and his partner sitting down and recording a video in their living room with that simple message that it gets better, and posted it on YouTube. And it generated this really interesting viral viral response where people started making their own videos and posting them and linking. So we helped him put together a site. Everything on here was done, is all hosted on YouTube. It's a fairly simple site. But what we got was this outpouring of incredible video from people all over the world. Some of it is very professional. You have, you know, a group of Google employees got together and did a really great video. The cast of a number of TV shows uh, got together and did videos. President Obama did a video. Hillary Clinton did a video. Some of it is also very grassroots. It's just individuals who, uh, you know, were moved by the stories that they heard and wanted to tell their own experience, maybe of being bullied or their own experience of going from, uh, you know, being a, a sort of teenager who felt alone to somebody who was accepted and part of a community. Um, it didn't require a tremendous amount of technology to do this. It required the, the willingness to ask, to ask people to tell the story, to give them that framework uh, to do it in. And if you haven't seen any of these, I highly recommend going to this site at itgetsbetterproject.org and, and watching some of these videos. It's really, really incredible stuff. Um, so what I want to do now is actually show you a little video. And this is something that we made for uh, the World Cup uh, bid committee. Uh, for the United States to get the World Cup. Unfortunately, we lost. Um, but the, uh, the challenge that we had is, you know, in the U.S., soccer fans are uh, 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 often an aggrieved bunch because it's, it's you know, the, the, one of the least watched sports, and so people feel very alone as a soccer fan uh, in many parts of the country. And so what we wanted to do was take a step back. And instead of just going directly to folks who like the sport and say, hey, help us with this, we actually wanted to tell a story about how soccer is actually an important part of American life, an important part of uh, you know, people's, uh, the sports that people watch. It connects a whole bunch of different communities, different age groups. Um, you know, this is obviously about sports, but the idea that I want you to take away from this is sometimes we get very zoomed in. We get very zoomed in to what our organization does, the services we provide, the challenges we face, the people that we deal with. And we, when we do our storytelling, we tell it from the perspective of somebody who already is there, who already gets the, the importance of it, who already gets you know, what it's all about. Sometimes what you need to do when you're engaging online, especially when you're trying to bring more people into the fold, is to step back and tell the bigger story. Tell the story again that you know so well of who you are, why you do what you do, the value it provides to the communities that you serve. And that, I think, is a crucial ingredient for broadening the appeal and the reach of what you're, what you're able to do. So we're going to watch this little video that we, uh, that we did for the soccer, uh, the soccer folks. Thank you. 
So think about those opportunities. You know, it doesn't. You don't always have to tell stories with fancy videos. Sometimes it's as much about what you write on your homepage and whether you're. You know, think about what's what's the first thing somebody who doesn't quite know your organization, know doesn't quite know what you do or the communities you serve. What's the first thing they see when they come to your site, or what's the first email that they get from you? Does it tell that bigger story? Does it connect the dots? Does it help them understand why they are an important part of that? Finding those opportunities to do that kind of storytelling is, is critically important to expanding your reach online. Um, equally important is the idea of authenticity. Um, and I'll pick on the GOP again one more time. Uh, this is what you don't want to do. This is an email uh, sent, uh, I think, three days before the midterm elections last year from the GOP to their email list announcing the release of a new web video. Um, this is probably the worst way in the world to release a web video with a press release uh, format. You want to be personal when you talk to people online because the medium is impersonal enough. And the last thing you want to do is send people press releases, unless they're members of the press, and even then, uh, probably not. All the email we send comes from an actual person. Nobody ever got an email from the Obama campaign. They got emails from Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, or Jeremy Byrd, the field director, or a volunteer in Iowa who had a story to tell. Bringing a personal and authentic voice of your organization, surfacing that in your communications to people, changes the way that people interact. And it, it personalizes something that can be very impersonal and very easy to ignore. Um, you know, we. Not sending press releases is, at this point, sort of somewhat conventional wisdom in our industry. 
more controversial is what you do about newsletters, which a lot of organizations send. And they tend to be a great way to kind of satisfy all the internal political constituencies within an organization, because you can give everybody a box in the newsletter. But they don't always work for the people receiving them, because they're not living in your world every day. They don't know, uh, you know all of the things that you're doing, and you're, you're overwhelming them. It, it may not be the John McCain seven paragraphs of text email, but even a newsletter with eight or nine stories, no clear call to action, no clear sort of statement of what, how, they should, how they're involved in what you're doing, it's, it, it tends to be impersonal, it tends to be, it, it gets read as inauthentic. So thinking about how to, how to surface those, uh, those authentic voices, those real, uh, you know, those real people in the organization is, uh, is important. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of this. It actually has nothing to do with the online world. This was a, a thank you postcard that I received from the Frank, Al Franken's senatorial campaign after I made an online donation. Um, and, you know, I picked this thing up out of my mailbox and I thought somebody had kidnapped my dog. <laughs> uh, but what this was in its, in its very sort of rambly, handwritten, kind of funny, a little weird way, was just his acknowledgement of my donation. Instead of sending me a generic thank you letter that had no personality and would have gone straight into the trash, they sent a postcard that was Al Franken. This is, this is his personality. It's the real guy that comes through. You know, looking for those opportunities where you're already communicating to people and personalizing it more, making it real, surfacing real stories, surfacing real people. Um, it makes everything you do more engaging and it helps build deeper relationships with people. Uh, we're going to watch a little uh, video here. Uh, we'll start the video and I'll talk about this in a sec. This is uh, actually Google, uh, which is a company that I think gets authenticity uh, for all their sort of bland utilitarian branding. They really get authenticity in a, in a good way. Hi, I'm Pat, and I'm a software engineer here at Google. I recently worked on automatic spell correction. My favorite band, Fish, is on a reunion tour, and they're coming here to Shoreline Amphitheater. Like many people, I have trouble spelling amphitheater. You probably already know that Google can correct your spelling. Now, if we're confident the spell corrected results are the results you wanted, then we'll show you some of those results right on the page. Part of our goal here at Google is to get you off the search result page and onto your answer as fast as possible. And if we can save you a click, then we can save you some time. So I'm pretty sure Pat is actually a software engineer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> This is a company that has, you know, as much money as they want to spend on marketing, they can spend on marketing. They could have made a slick video promoting this feature or anything else. But what they tend to do is to surface the real people in the organization who are doing the work and who care about it and who are passionate. And that tends to be far more compelling than the slick marketing presentations. So, you know, this is a, a, a lesson that, you know, we, we sometimes struggle with, with with organizations that have limited budgets and limited resources. They kind of say, we can't afford to make these, like, slick videos. We can't afford to, you know, even producing web content can be a struggle to make it look, look clean, make it look good. But sometimes the best thing you can do is just to be real and just to be who you are and to put that out there. And so think about those opportunities, the, the actual faces of your organization. See, one more example, this is from the, the 08 campaign, and it was one of the most effective fundraising uh, uh, tools that the campaign had was a, uh, you know, we do these strategy briefings. And if, if, you know, if you ever, if you're the sort of person that can give, you know, the, the, the maximum allowed contribution to a campaign or get your friends to give the maximum allowed contribution, you get invited to these, these dinners, usually in places very much like this, and you know, they serve you some, some, some chicken or whatever, and you get a little strategy briefing from the campaign manager. And they talk about what they're doing with your money, how the campaign's going, and all of that. But we said, you know, hey, it's, well then it was 2008, this is the age of the internet, there's no reason you should have to give $2,500 or, uh, you know, to, in order to get a strategy briefing. So we shot a series of videos in David Pluff's office. What we're going to see here, this, the original video is about five minutes long, I just edited it down to give you a sense of, of, of the content of it, but we'll just watch this quickly. Hey everybody, it's David Pluff, Barack's campaign manager, 49 days out from the election. And so we thought we'd take a moment to update you on where we are in the battleground states in particular. About 10 to 15 percent of the electorate is still undecided. And so in all of these states, we have a lot of team leaders who are out there talking to these swing voters out again. The Republicans got a little boost uh, at coming out of their convention. Whose supporters are most excited, most motivated to turn out? We still enjoy a very important one, Florida, by 380,000 votes in 2000. We have uh, 
over 320,000 Democrats now newly registered this year, and the Republicans have lost. It's going to open up the hood a little bit, uh, and I think hopefully describe to you why we still need your financial help and why we ask you to do so much. So, I mean, what you see with this is. That's David Clough, the campaign manager. He's sitting in his office, he's got his water bottle, he's got a stack of papers, he's got his maps. This is, this is the real guy, this is the real deal. This is what he does every day. So he goes through maps and charts and counts of voters and opinion polls and tries to synthesize it all into a strategy. Um, that kind of storytelling, putting that forward and showing people when you're asking them for money, when you're showing them this and you're showing them where that's, how that's getting used, was far more effective than a lot of things that we did that were much slicker and much more polished. And it was one of the, the sort of great uh, uh, successes of the Obama campaign, particularly in contrast to Hillary Clinton's campaign. Every video she put out was slick, it was professionally lit, it was it, you know, filmed in a beautiful setting, and it didn't connect with people on an emotional level. It didn't help build that relationship. Seeing the guy in his office, that actually ends up being perversely more effective. And so look for, the, again, those opportunities to surface authenticity. And next slide. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the concept of ownership and giving people ownership in what you do. Uh, so this is a, a, a program, you know, I'm sure most of you have received solicitations, usually direct mail or sometimes online, that say, if you make a donation to our organization within the next 24 hours or 48 hours, your donation will be matched by an anonymous donor two to one or three to one. Um, well, you know, those, those are effective. I mean, people, they do them for a reason. They actually do work and they do help people give. But they don't do a great job of building a relationship between you, the donor, and the organization. And the reason that we think for that is in part because you're feeling kind of small and unimportant when you're looking at a letter like that. Because somebody's ponied up a few million dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to match you, and you're writing a check or making an online donation for 25 bucks. Well, it's kind of small, it's kind of unimportant, and it's sort of you do it out of obligation or you do it out of a sense of urgency, but it ultimately puts you in your place as a small, small, small piece of what the organization is about. So we built a tool that um, we called Grassroots Match, and the idea was to say, we have all these people who have given to, uh, uh, in this case it's for the Democratic Party, but all these people have given to the Democratic Party before, we'd like them to give again. So what we're going to do is ask them as individuals to match the donation of somebody who's never given to the party before, and to make a pledge, and it can be for any amount, it can be $5, it can be $50, it can be $500. And then we went to all the people who had, ne who had never given and said, hey, there are hundreds of thousands of people out there, real people, who are going to match your donation, even if it's five bucks, and we want you to give for the first time. So when people went online and they made that donation, they got a message that said, hey, your donation has been matched by Yasha in Boston. Um, you know, I had written a little personal message, or you know, all the people who had pledged to match had written a little personal message. You can see, uh, you know, I, I, the, the, the first time donor had the opportunity to write me an email back. In this case, a very simple message just saying, you know, hey, it was really generous for you putting dollars up front for this campaign. Can't give much, but this is what I can give. Uh, those kinds of person-to-person -person connections build a sense of ownership. Because I, as somebody who has been matched or somebody who matched somebody else's donation, understand that it was my sponsorship that inspired somebody to give. And you know, it may have not been a lot of money, but that all over the country there are these, these connections, these matches being made. In addition to the financial benefits of this and these sort of psychological benefits of people feeling that sense of ownership about the campaign that they're participating in, there's a really interesting content benefit that happens. And this is sometimes I think a thing that organizations overlook is what you do isn't just about the services you provide. When you're engaging people online, when you're engaging with donors, when you're engaging with volunteers, it's, you're connecting to them, but you're also connecting them to each other. And so what came out of this is a whole lot of you know, very simple notes, I just go back one, uh, very simple notes like the one you just saw um, that, uh, thank you, that, that uh, were you know, between individuals who made donations, but sometimes people actually made friends through this tool. They get a thank you note from somebody who was you know, perhaps a, a very different person from them in a very different part of the country, but whose, whose note struck a chord with them, and they'd, they'd strike up a conversation, they'd email back and forth, 
And we actually mined the content that we got from that and then shared the larger story, shared some of the best interactions that happened between matched donors out to the whole email list to sort of reinforce the story of this is a campaign of millions of Americans from very different places, very different walks of life, all coming together to support a common set of goals. Uh, so sharing the story of a teacher in rural Pennsylvania who gets matched by a new citizen, uh, you know, store clerk in California who, you know, start up a good dialogue, that actually, that, that tells a bigger story to the whole audience when you, when you recirculate that. Um, next slide. The other thing of ownership is getting people to become your advocates. You know, when somebody takes an action on your behalf that's public, where they, they make a statement about what their support for you, their support for a goal, whether it's a legislative goal, whether it's uh, you know, a, a, a political goal, um, that changes their relationship to you. They become owners of your cause. And so we try to give our clients tools to turn their participants into advocates. This is one example of Freedom to Marry uh, is fighting for marriage equality. And we built them a tool that they used as a wedding registry so that couples, gay and straight, who were getting married, could register and instead of saying, hey, get me a new toaster, they said, let's make a donation uh, in our name on behalf of marriage equality. And when a couple does that, when somebody sends that email out to their friends, whether it's something like this, whether it's saying, uh, you know, I'm trying to raise uh, $100 to, uh, you know, support my local school system, whether it's, uh, you know, I just, uh, I just called my senator to, you know, talk about this piece of legislation that affects my community. Those public dec declarations not only spread the word, but they be the people who make them become, they feel much more connected to who you are. They have a much deeper relationship to your mission. They internalize it. It becomes theirs. So looking for those opportunities to get people to take that ownership, to, to take those advocacy steps. If you have uh, a web page somewhere where you're asking somebody to write uh, you know, somebody uh, on Beacon Hill, at the end of that, after they've written that letter, you need to give them an opportunity to tell other people about it. Um, you know, make sure that there's a, there's a page there that says, now tweet this, or now post this on Facebook. Um, those kinds of opportunities change people's relationships. Uh, this is a, a, an example, actually, again, not from the, the not-for-profit or political world at all. This is uh, TiVo. Um, and, you know, for, for those of you, uh, presume folks know, TiVo is a you know, video recording device that you record TV shows, skip commercials, all of that. When it first came out in 2000, uh, TiVo was a, uh, a really kind of novel device, and immediately there's this community of sort of serious geeks who, who gravitated towards it and started buying it. And, but they also started tinkering with it in some really interesting ways. They'd open up the box, they'd add hardware to it, they'd make changes to the software. They were basically hacking with, with the, the, the TiVo system. Now most companies, when you open up their, their consumer electronics and post pictures of it on the internet, they send you a cease and desist letter because they don't want you doing that. TiVo instead recognized that the people who were hacking their box and hacking their system were also their most passionate supporters and most passionate fans. They were leaders in their community. And so instead of trying to shut them down, they engaged them. They actually went out and they, you know, they said they sent their product managers and their, their engineers to the to the online message boards where people were talking about the hacks they were making to the TiVo, and they, they started participating in the community. They said, "Oh, that's a, we saw what you guys did with the with the box. It's a great idea. We're going to incorporate that into the next version that we build officially." Um, you know, they gave people tips when they ran into difficult problems. That idea of thinking about who in your world are really your leaders, and how do you how do you connect with them? How do you recognize that leadership? How do you empower them to be a public face for you? You know, the, the folks that were hacking TiVo's, these were the people who, sitting around the Thanksgiving dinner table, were the ones telling all of their relatives about this amazing TiVo box that they got and encouraging them to get one. They were the people that were promoting the thing. So, um, finding those opportunities, and actually I think there's, there's some interesting stories that we'll hear on the panel of how you can, you can take your most uh, active participants and, and, and make them you know, real honors in what you're doing. Next slide. Um, this is another, you know, really uh, one of my favorite examples. It's important to, part of ownership is letting people innovate with what you are about and, and what you do. So asking people 
you know, for their opinion. What should we be doing? How do we get better? Looking for people that are doing innovative things, recognizing that, and creating you know, a culture that supports people trying new approaches, whether it's to fundraising or awareness or legislative contact, um, and making that something that you embrace and encourage in your community. This is an example from the 08 campaign, sort of a very old tradition uh, in the Midwest of painting barns with political campaign slogans, and it, it kind of died out, you know, the interstate system sort of, uh, uh, you know, nobody, nobody drives by barns anymore, so it kind of disappeared. And somebody revived it for Obama. They just painted a giant Obama logo on the side of their barn in rural Iowa. And the campaign saw this and they said, huh, that's pretty cool. You know, that's a, that's a really clever idea. We wouldn't have thought of that. So they started recruiting volunteers in rural parts of uh, America to uh, add Obama logos to the sides of barns. And they provided materials, little projector templates people could use to trace the logo, color, color information. Uh, and they created a community around this. So this was an idea that I don't think anybody in Chicago would have thought about a barn as a good campaign vehicle. But somebody had that idea, they embraced it, they recognized it, and they encouraged people to, uh, you know, to own it. Um, think about those opportunities in your own community. Ask people, reach out, encourage them. Next slide. Um, so this is I think, the last, last example I want to show. Um, sometimes the ask that you make of people can be very small. It doesn't have to be painting your barn. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, creating a wedding registry. We ran a campaign in the UK against the BNP, which is the British National Party. They're this far-right, um, anti-immigrant, uh, racist party that unfortunately has gained some political traction in the last five or six years. And so we organized a campaign. It wasn't for any political party, but it was against this party, and it was against this group, and it was against their ideology. And the idea was to say, not in my name. These people don't speak for me as a Brit. So what we did is we asked people to sign a petition, and as part of that, to write the phrase, not to take a picture of themselves with the phrase, not in my name, visible, and upload it onto the site. And so we, you know, we, we basically encouraged this, this very small public declaration, this very small act of participation, and then we took all of that content and posted it up, you can see the photo gallery there, and edited it into a video that I'll show you. Um, this became the largest political list in Great Britain, um, larger than either any of the major party lists, uh, on the backs of a campaign of people saying, these guys don't stand for me, and taking that little act of ownership, that little act of participation. So I'll show you the video.
So we ask people to do something pretty small, sign an online petition to take a photograph to upload it. And 100,000 people did. Well, in the, last, in the elections last year, when the BMP was standing for a, a few parliamentary seats and actually had a, a good chance of winning a couple of them, we went back to those 100,000 people and we said, OK, we need your help. We need you to do something bigger now. And we had thousands of volunteers who turned out from that email list to walk in the neighborhoods where the BMP was running, to hand out literature, to talk to voters, to participate in their community. The little acts of participation, the little acts of ownership, set the stage for much bigger things that had a much bigger impact. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a sort of point of personal and professional pride for me. The BMP lost uh, for all of the seats they're running for in Parliament and in the letter that Nick Griffin, who you saw at the beginning of that video, posted on his website uh, the day after their defeat. They, they called out Blue State Digital and our dirty tricks specifically <laughs> as uh, one of the causes of their defeat. So, you know, this, these kinds of... I mean, these kinds of little actions can have a big impact, and you have to cultivate these relationships. You have to cultivate that sense of ownership. Think about the little things you can get people to do that will get them more engaged. Um, so uh, I'll wrap this up. These are kind of four key principles that, that we think about in every campaign that we run, whether it's for a big organization with a big budget or a small organization. Driving action, getting people to do things, getting people to don't just talk at them, get them involved in every opportunity you have. Telling stories, connecting with people at a human level, telling them both the stories of what you're doing, but also telling stories that involve them. Tell the stories of their role, why they're important to your organization, what they, how they make it possible for you to do what you, what you need to do. Uh, authenticity, servicing the real voices, showing people the reality, even if it isn't all that sexy or glamorous, that can be a lot more compelling than something that feels slick and mass produced. And then giving people that sense of ownership, getting people to feel like your cause is their cause through things big and small, that changes their relationship to you, it makes them more active and it means when you really need them, they're going to be there for you. Um, so that's, uh, that's it. Thank you very much uh, for listening. This is our website and if you are on Twitter, that's uh, where you